in our study groups. Because many of us don't have the opportunity to study the Upanishads. And this gives us an opportunity to try to understand at a high level what the Upanishads are teaching. How many episodes have we watched so far? This will show if, you've, if you're coming or not. Eight. One answer. Because she leads the study group, that's why. Everyone else looked away when I asked. <laughs> I'm going to give you <clears throat> the connection between the first eight episodes. And then there's some questions <coughs> that were unresolved. And if you have any questions, then afterwards I can address those too. So I'll be brief with all of this. We're uh, ten minutes over today because of the special announcements. Episode 1 has the same purpose as chapter 1 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. What is the purpose of chapter 1 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita? Especially knowing that there's no teachings in chapter 1. The teachings begin in Shloka 11 of chapter 2. So why do we have 47 shlokas that don't teach us anything? What is conveyed is relatability. That we're like Prince Arjuna. He has fear. I have fear. He has a family. I have a family. He has responsibilities professionally. I have responsibilities professionally too. So chapter 1 is simply for us to connect to Prince Arjuna. When I meet uh, seekers, they have this innate resistance to learning from people who are not married. I realize that before I was married and now, <laughs> now that I'm married, there's a different level of, of connection. The relatability comes in there, the, of the work that is involved with, with being married, with having a child, etc. So chapter 1 is like, like that. An episode is episode 1 of Upanishad Ganga shows this young man who is revolting against his father. You've all experienced that, right? <laughs> I heard one teacher say, by the time a, a and a, a father, by the time a father realizes what his father was teaching him, he is a son who is disobeying <laughs> Disobeying him. <laughs> so, we have this son who doesn't understand his father's perspective. And that's very much like the world right now. And then we fast forward to chapter 2, or episode 2, which is called Prashnakaro, which is think. And when this young man starts to think, he starts to tune into his father's perspective. In other words, he tunes into a more expansive perspective. If I don't think, I see a lot of separation in this room. Girls, boys, Flint, Pittsburgh, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. But if I think more, all of those distinctions go away. I see human beings. I see God's creatures. That was the emphasis in, in uh, episode 2, is think. Think about you. Think about what you're doing. And when that boy does, he realizes, I was living a pretty superficial life, and I want to find something with more substance. Which leads us to episode 3. Who was the personality we studied in episode 3? Ratnakar. Who did Ratnakar become? Sant Valmiki. Ratnakar, his only focus is his family. And he justifies in his mind that it's okay if I hurt other families as long as I look after my family. I meet many people who say, I don't need to study Vedanta. I'm a good person. I have good thoughts. And then they look at me like this, you know, very standoffish. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> and I have a simple response, good. If you want good happiness, keep being good. But if you want extraordinary happiness, you need to be extraordinary in where you're directing your love. It can't just be directed to three or four people. You need to direct it to three or four thousand people, three or four million people, etc. If you really want extraordinary happiness. Now in this room, do you want a little bit of money or a lot of money? <laughs> right on. <laughs> He's saying that, but if given the option, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll take a lot of money. <laughs> In the same way, do we want a little bit of love or do we want a lot of love? But we have to give lots of love to receive lots of love. I heard one teacher that said, one knows how much one is, how much love one is giving 
by the smiles and the faces of the people around them. If people are always crying around you, there's a problem. <laughs> there's a problem. But if everyone is always smiling around you, then something good. You're doing something good in, in your life. So Ratnakar, the episode is connecting two to three, is if you think, if we think, we will realize that there's more to life than just this circle. There's a bigger circle that exists. Episode four, the personality we studied was Ashta Vakra. This boy who's born with eight crooked parts of his body. Like my elbows are straight, his is crooked. He can't make that straight. And his whole body's like that. And he walks into Raja Janaka's court. And Raja Janaka's famous for having assemblies of wise people. Satsang, like this. And when they see Raja Janaka, as they, when they see Yashtavakra, what do the people do? They laugh at him. See, just like I talked about people with special needs. We have two reactions when we come across people with special needs. Uh, physical or mental. One, I feel sorry for them. Two, I'm glad that's not me. But that's an unthinking perspective. My wife trained to be a special education lawyer, to advocate for people with special needs so that they can study too. Because often they're marginalized and they're not given the attention that they deserve. She now practices immigration law. Where the cases she takes up, these people are marginalized as well. So her and I have a lot of discussions about people with special needs. And my mother-in-law is a forensic psychiatrist, so she only works with criminals. It's a very unique family that <laughs> we're putting together. <laughs> and uh, she always saying, and, and with our Vedantic thoughts too, the purpose of life is not to run fast. The purpose of life is not to say that I'm more wealthy than you. The purpose of life is to be happy. So someone with Down syndrome, autism, someone is missing a leg, can't hear, whatever it may be, does that mean they're less happy? We don't know that. We may infer that, but that's just from our limited judgment. So I don't want to be judged, so why should I judge them? They may be happier, I envy them then, because they're more involved than I am. So Ashtag Bakra has this high-level message that is unspoken, but into the more tangible message, he debates with another scholar. And this scholar only debates that if you lose, you have to commit suicide. That's his terms. That if I beat you, you have to drown yourself. And Ashtavaka defeats this scholar. And this scholar says, I'm ready to accept my punishment. My punishment, really. And Ashtavaka says, I have a different kind of punishment for you. I want you to change your ways. Don't use the Shastra as a Shastra. Just a difference in the length of the A, and the same word changes from scripture to weapon. Shastra means weapon. Shastra, Shastra means weapon. Shastra means scripture. And you know why that's the worst punishment? It requires more effort. Committing suicide is relatively easy. But to change, that requires a lot of effort. Imagine letting go of anger. We're angry just thinking of letting go, <laughs> letting go of anger, of how much effort we'd have to put in. That was the messages of, of chat, episode four. Aren't they awesome messages? And it's an audio-visual presentation. It makes me um, humble knowing the vision of Buddha Swami Tejumayananda. He was born in the middle of Madhya Pradesh. He's 60-something years old. But how in tune is with the people that yes, we should create this, this production. Chapter 5 and 6, it's part 1 and part 2, and the main personality is Dharashiko. Dharashiko is what religion's name? Islam. And though an Islamic ruler, not just a practitioner of Islam, he's a ruler, which means everybody's watching. And what is he doing? Studying the Vedas studying the Upanishads specifically because he knows this has nothing to do with religion, race, gender, income. That this is the truth. Nobody owns the truth. And he's studying, his, uh, studying the Upanishads from a Hindu guru. 
and translating this into Persian. And nobody understands him. So what do they do? They kill him. Many of the martyrs in life knew that the truth was more important than their own bodies. And they could do more dying than living. Because now we have episodes about this. Puja Swami Chinmayananda had the vision to awaken Hindus to, to convert Hindus to Hinduism. <laughs> we don't even believe in conversion. You can be converted. But he says it. What it means is to believe in the teachings of Hinduism. Then you're a Hindu. If you don't believe in the teachings of Gita, you're not a Hindu. If you do believe in the teachings of Gita, you're a Hindu. See, there's no externality. I would tell like, so I'm more of a Hindu than you are. Right? What kind of... And that's the way we, we practice. I know more mantras than you. I have a longer beard. I have a longer hair. I have longer hair, so I'm, I'm more like this. Do you remember the movie Tal? Right? Then if I use this example, oh yeah, yeah, we get it. So in the movie, Akshay Khanna is arguing with his uh, in-law, not in-laws, but brother and sisters, um, sister-in-law, and they break a glass, they're arguing with him. So he walks over to the bar and breaks six glasses and says, if breaking glasses makes one right, then apparently I, <laughs> I'm right then. <laughs> See, we think like that. And now... Uh, a purpose of Chinmay mission is to awaken Indians to India. We have so much in Sanatana Dharma, so much in Bharat. There's nowhere else that we need to go. I will only look to another woman if I don't think my wife is most beautiful. But if I think my wife is most beautiful, why would I look to another woman? And where is beauty? In where? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The body naturally will become older, less technically beautiful. The skin will become less elastic, etc. But it's in the eye of the beholder. So let us study our own scriptures. Let us go to our own nation. I met a chick recently who's doing a tour of uh, Europe. And I listened to what he had said and I didn't say anything wrong with what he's doing because he's already made the plans. But I just talked about India afterwards. And I said, India is like Europe. You go to Belgium, you go to Italy, you go to Croatia, Poland, etc. In India, you can go from Odisha, Odisha to Andhra, to Gujarat, to Kerala. And it's like you're going to a different country. Different puja, different food, different language, different education. And you'll save so much money. <laughs> there's two worlds. There's the world and then there's India. There's Bharat. This is why I like to take our chicks to Bharat. Because when you take them, you take them to your families. Where they have to eat too much and they don't know anyone. <laughs> and they just go to the cities, which are too crowded and there's too much traffic. But in the ashrams and the villages, it's very different. One begins to love the spirit of Bharat. Five and six. Episode 7 is on the Vedangas, which are auxiliary subjects to understand the Veda. Sanskrit grammar, for example, is one of the Vedangas. Uh, Vyakarna. When we were living in Mumbai and studying Sanskrit, we didn't study conversational Sanskrit. We studied grammar. It's intense. When my wife had come to visit, when my parents came to visit, they sat in class, but they had no idea what was going on. They had no idea how I was in that class. I had no idea how I was in that class. <laughs> Intense grammar. And why we study is just so we can understand the scriptures more. It's not to come to a mic and show off, oh, I know this rule and I know this uh, translation. It's so I can know the scriptures more. And the high-level message, if one is not prepared, one cannot understand if you had an argument at home this morning, are you here? Or are you at home right now? Your body may be here, but your mind is still over there. Even if you're hungry and you drove by Panera and they have a new sign for their broccoli and cheddar soup, you are here, but you're, <laughs> but you're actually over there. And we have to prepare ourselves for this study. 
Episode 8 is on the Upavedas, like Ayurveda. Ayurveda is a study of medicine. Artha Shastra, the study of economics. The modern world thinks, I think his name is Adam Smith, who is the father of economics. That's not true. We have scriptures that are dated millennia before Adam Smith had anything to say. Same with Ayurveda. Pediatric, surgery, um, sterilizing instruments, that's all recorded in Ayurveda. Dhanurveda, weaponry. We believe we have modern weapons now. This is back in the day. Single arrow, they can change into whatever, like we see in, in Ramayana, etc. And the high level point of, of um, episode 8, I think with Android, Android is open source technology, or right, you can just take that software and apply it to whatever you want. Sanatana Dharma is the same way. We don't own anything. We don't possess anything. This is for everyone. It's now that we try to patent turmeric. I own the word yoga. You have to pay me royalties if you <laughs> use the word yoga. Many people criticize Sanatana Dharma. You, you people didn't document well. Maybe we didn't want to document well. Maybe we didn't try to possess this and this and this. Maybe it belongs to everyone. And here, it belongs to us too. We should study Ayurveda. We should study Dhanurveda. And so on and so forth. So this is what we've studied so far. Good. It's fascinating. Really, really, really enjoyable is watching Upanishad Ganga. But not just watching it, learning from it. Many people in this room, we watched the Truman Show last night here at uh, Chinmaya Sanjeevani. And some people had watched it before and thought it was psychedelic or boring in the past. But yesterday, everyone enjoyed it so much because we looked at it with a different vision. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder again. We can learn from any movie, any experience. Try to take up Upanishad Ganga with the same intensity. It will be a very moving scripture, really. Some of your questions. <clears throat> Number one. The very thought of the Lord drives away difficulties. How? The very thought of the Lord drives away difficulties. How? That boy who was hurting other people in this school a few days ago, he began that with a thought. He had a thought of doing it and it expressed in the form of action. If he didn't think it, he couldn't have expressed that through action. It's impossible. In the same way, if you didn't think about coming here today, you would not be here today. But you thought it, and then the body just followed suit. A thought is one of the most powerful instruments in the universe. And here, we have to be careful with what we think. Because it's very creative and very destructive. Some of the music we listen to, some of the movies we watch. Remember Bollywood songs 25 years ago? And Bollywood songs now? Before they were so soft, gentle, thoughtful. Now they're very crass and who knows what language they're speaking? There's, there's just an assortment of languages. It's like Mumbai, right? Who knows what you're speaking in Mumbai? <laughs> so many languages are, are mixed up. And it's affecting us. We don't think it's affecting us, but it is. How many parents does a typical child now have? Three. Mother, father, and iPad. <laughs> Third parent is iPad. And what happens when I only use an iPad or I'm excessive with my iPad or any tablet, computer? It requires effort to talk to someone, isn't it? To meet them, get to know them, understand them, reply to them, stay awake. But with an iPad, I don't have to put in any effort. This is part of the laziness that develops in one. We have to be vigilant not to get into such habits. Even complaining is a poor habit to get into. 
When someone doesn't check their complaining, it turns into criticism. If someone doesn't check criticism, it turns into crying. Not for anyone else, but for myself. Someone who's very critical of others is always crying. Because there's just nothing to look forward to. What a sad state of being. In Tosi Ramayana, there's a section called Namayana. The story of the name, Nama. And there, Tosi Dasi writes, The name is the master... The meaning of the name is the servant. And wherever a master goes, then a servant has to go too, correct? So let's take some examples of that. When I say Pittsburgh Penguins, what do you think of? You think of Sidney Crosby, then you think he's Canadian, then you think, oh, Canada's great, I should move to to Canada. (laughs) And on and on and on. From just Pittsburgh Penguins. When one says, Kulfi, we think of all of the different flavors of coffee. Then we think about the dhabas uh-huh. in India. And they're so dirty, but it's so delicious. <laughs> and we get lost in that channel. So what came first? Dhaba or the thoughts of dhaba? See, dhaba is the master. The thoughts of the dhaba is the servant. When we say Rama, what comes to mind? Strength, beauty, courage, love, uh, example, king son, etc., etc. So if I just think of Rama, all of my thoughts start to change. I've told you many times about the example of when Sheila and I went to see paranormal activity and she couldn't sleep because she had these horrific thoughts. And then she started chanting Hanuman Chalisa and went straight to sleep because her thoughts changed. The last point I want to make about answering this question have you ever been sued before? Even if you did not, like you're going to put your, <laughs> put your hand up. If someone sends you an email saying, you know, I'm going to sue you for say, l- slander against me, what do you do? Press delete. When someone sends you a letter, what do you do? Put it in the trash. When someone's lawyer calls you, then what do you do? You hire a lawyer and respond. Correct? You're all thinking, hey, how do you know? (laughs) I told you, my wife is an immigration attorney. So, if we call out to Bhagavan, he doesn't have a choice but to answer. Maybe we don't call enough quantity. Maybe we don't call sincerely enough quality, so he doesn't answer. But if we up the ante with quantity and quality, he has no choice, he or she, but to answer. And many of our sadhus have verified this. Like Swami Shivananda, Tulsidasji. These are not figures from a thousand years ago. This is our own lifetime. This is all documented. So take the Lord's name, even in vain. In many of our uh, practices, we say, bless you now. If one of you sneezes, I'll hear three people say, bless you. Have you ever thought of why you say, bless you? Here are three interpretations that I've heard of why people say bless you. All highly illogical. (laughs) The first, some people believe that when you sneeze, your soul is trying to go from your lungs through your nose and out. (laughs) So when someone else says bless you, it's like, hey soul, go back into that nose, through the throat, (laughs) into the lungs. So logical for two reasons. All of a sudden, my soul lives in my lungs. And even more audacious is I have the power to put your soul back into your body. (laughs) A second reason I heard is that when you sneeze, your body stops. You know, like that Indian game statue. Everything stops. And then you need a Mahatma like me to come more you and say, bless you. And then the body starts again. (laughs) Like we have the power to start the body again. Illogical, correct? You're laughing. And the third is illogical today. People used to say bless you because back in the day people used to have the plague and if they had sneezed, they may not survive. I don't think the plague exists anywhere in America other than Atlanta right now. 
the Center for Disease Control. That's what it's called, right? They must have some sort of plague down there. But no one else, so why are you saying bless you? In Srimad Bhagavatam, what Bhagavan teaches there, you take my name even in vain. When you sneeze, say Shiva. When you pass gas, say, say Rama. Whatever. Take the Lord's name in vain. Look what Shishupal did. Now he's enlightened. The idea is that if I keep thinking about that, of that name, the meaning will come to. The very thought of the Lord drives away difficulties. How? For these three reasons. The name is powerful. The name is a master. And Bhagavan answers this call. Next question. How to cultivate a relationship with Bhagavan? How many of you have sons or daughters, or you, that are entering that age where you want them to get married? By show of hands. Only one. I'm surprised. You're Indians, are you sure? <laughs> it seems like we start planning when we're 15. <laughs> And now many people use many resources to find a, a significant other, whether it's matrimony.com or shadi.com. I saw, and not that I'm looking, but I saw, <laughs> I saw one website that said farmersonly.com. So farmers can find farmers. Very funny. You can check out this website. It's very funny. So we look for another person, and then we study them, isn't it? Where were they born? Where did they study? What kind of personality did they have? What kind of sports did they like? What part of India or wherever they're from? We study them, correct? And that's the basis to further that relationship or not entertain that relationship. The same applies with the Lord. If one studies who Hanumanji truly is, who Lord Shiva truly is, who Devi truly is, then one will want to have a relationship with them. But if I just see Hanumanji will take, or Lord Ganesha, fat stomach, human body, but then upper body is this elephant, you know, he himself is confused. How can I <laughs> get any clarity from him? But if I study what all of this means, that he's a listener, that he discriminates with his uh, trunk, that he balances good and bad with his stomach, I think I like Lord Ganesha. I think I want to be his friend. What did the gopis want to do with Lord Krishna? They wanted him to be their spouse. And though they had actual spouses, they saw projected on their spouses, Lord Krishna. They were the most devoted wives. Husbands, this is what we used to see our wives as. <laughs> as these devis. As Shakti, you know, Lord Shiva is great with that. He says, half of me is, is my wife, is that Devi. So study who Bhagavan is, and it becomes more natural to develop a relationship with the Creator. Point number one. Point number two. When you go to Shadi.com and you identify, say, three or four people, then what do you do? You communicate with them. You send them an email. Let's, let's meet up for dosa. <laughs> let's, you know, let's go to the temple and we'll pretend to be sattvic and then we'll meet outside. <laughs> like an Indian movie. We'll sit underneath the tree. <laughs> communicate. Communicate with Bhagavan. Talk to him. Talk to her. He doesn't have to be in Sanskrit. Bhagavan knows all languages. He knows a language that words are not used. Tell him about your problems. Tell him about your prayers. Tell him about what you want. Tell him about what you don't want. Just talk to him. One of my teachers had shared, in prayer, we communicate with the Lord. In meditation, he communicates with us. But he won't speak to us unless we're interested. That's why we have to initiate the communication. Keep a journal. Don't speak it, but... Write a letter to him every day. We do this in some of our camps is that they have to write a, write a letter to God. Dear God. And then write. So one girl had asked me after this, after this exercise, she goes, so is God going to answer my letter now? And I said, yes, but maybe not in the way you want him to, that he will actually give you a letter. But what you asked and question will be answered in a way that you will be ready for. An email, a quote, a movie, a sport, an animal. 
will be answered. She was happy with that answer. I know you're all not. <laughs> but she was happy with that answer because it's the truth. And the third way to cultivate a relationship with Bhagavan is you have to believe he or she exists. If I talk to my brother over here, you call me bipolar. You call me schizophrenic. Right? Because you don't believe that he's over here and I do believe. So we think, communicate to Kurma? What kind of person are you? And we, we judge. But just because I can't see someone doesn't mean they don't exist, right? Have any of you seen Mahatma Gandhi? No. If Mahatma Gandhi didn't exist, he did. He's still alive today through his teachings, through his message. He's more popular now than ever with technology. And the whole day is dedicated to his birth and to his death. We have to believe that God exists to truly develop a relationship. I cannot develop a relationship with a being that I don't believe exists. So the question is, do you believe that God exists? And many of us think no, but we've not studied. And that's why people like Pooja Swami Vivekananda and Pooja Swami Chinmayananda, they were atheists. When they were growing up, both of these masters, both of these giants, were full out atheists. But what separates these two atheists from the typical atheist is that they knew what they did believe in and didn't believe in because they studied it thoroughly. Many of us say we're atheists because we're too tired to practice theism. It requires more effort to practice theism. But we've not put in the effort. So I just want to highlight we have to believe Bhagavan to have a relationship with Bhagavan. And I'll answer one more question from here and then I'll take any questions from the field. My, mon, my mind wanders with various thoughts. True. All of our minds do. An internal dialogue. Even now, isn't the internal dialogue going on? When is he going to stop speaking? I wonder what's happening for lunch right now. <laughs> There's special people here, so maybe there'll be a special lunch today. <laughs> Even when I do japa while doing chores or driving, is it okay... Is it okay, or how do I reduce the thoughts in internal dialogue? I'll read the question again. My mind wanders with various thoughts and in internal dialogue. Even when I do japa, or even while I'm doing chores or driving, is it okay, or how do I reduce the thoughts in internal dialogue? The first is, everything is okay. Everything that happens in life is okay. It's all right. By believing otherwise, does the situation improve? It's okay. We tend to be very fatalistic. It's not okay, it's not alright, and we get sucked into that negativity. <clears throat> it's okay, it's alright. If you remember Batman Begins, we watched this together in Flint. Here, I think we watched it too. Bruce Wayne's parents are just killed. He's sitting in the police station. He's very young, boy, maybe 10 years old. Detective Gordon comes and just takes his coat off and puts it around his shoulders and just rubs his shoulders and says, it'll be all right. It, that's it. He just keeps saying, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. And then when you fast forward to the third movie, right at the end where Batman apparently is going to sacrifice his life for the city, Detective Gordon says, but we don't know who you are. And he says, Batman can be anyone, even someone who says, it's all right. And then he thinks back that he realizes who Batman actually is. That, that small gesture, like Satishi was saying, can change someone completely. When you are completely exhausted, Flint people, you left at around 4 a.m. or you got up at 4 a.m. and you went to sleep at 10 or 11 yesterday. Did you sleep well? Did you want to wake up? No. <laughs> Because you were so exhausted. So you slept well. Some of you are sleeping now too. <laughs> but days when we don't do anything, then it's more difficult to sleep, isn't it? I just don't feel physically or mentally tired. But when I'm very physically and mentally tired, then I sleep well. 
That's why, to reduce thoughts and internal dialogue, Lord Krishna has begun His teachings, chapter 3, 4, 5, Karma Yoga. Act intelligently. Act thoughtfully. Do your responsibilities. Do seva. Be selfless. You have all of this energy, and the energy is too much for you to be quiet. So, rid yourself of that energy in the right way. Then you'll be able to um, sit quietly. In some of our Balgar classes, when they're getting too restless, what do we do? Do super brain yoga. So we make them do uttak bataks, you know? Yeah. You sit down, or, or we say do tapas, and they all have to stand on one leg with their hands over there, and then they get so tired, then they sit down, and then they say, when can we do it again? <laughs> but when they're a little bit more tired physically, then their minds get channelized into where we want to take them. For us at a bigger level, is that we have to work more. Isn't it that we work all week just to do nothing on the weekend? <laughs> what a dichotomy. I'm going to work so hard all week and just do nothing. I've met people who don't bathe over the weekend. <laughs> That's their, their, their dream. I can't wait for the weekend so I don't have to go in the shower. <laughs> Those are the people sitting far away from everyone <laughs> right now. <laughs> And expanding this more, isn't it that we work so hard so we can retire and do nothing? Work should never end, only the direction of work should change. So the first way to reduce thoughts and dialogue, do seva. And make everything seva then. I'll give you a small example of that. We're all busy, more busy than ever. And sometimes the people we give least time to is our own family. We give dedicated time to our friends and neighbors, but our own family, we tend not to give time to. Start visualizing your own son, daughter, parent, whatever it is, as a friend. That you're there for your friend, to listen to them, to speak to them. I'm there for my grandparents, my nani as an example, you know. I treat, she's my friend, so just like I give that friend some time, I should give her time too. And it may sound calculated, but it helps one to be more relaxed, more open. So specific volunteering should translate into everything should become volunteering. From a hobby to a lifestyle. Karma Yoga. Second strategy is Japa. Janma Pati Iti Japa. Back in the day, when people didn't have this knowledge, they used to think, I don't want to die. When one, when one studies this knowledge, it's not I don't want to die, I don't want to be born. <laughs> I know I'm already alive and I have to die, but I don't want to come back again. I don't want the suffering that comes with being in the, in the limited world when my nature is limitless. If you and I do japa, sincerely, this will protect us from being reborn again. And I already explained the power of japa in the first question. The mind will always have thoughts. Yesterday there was a series of diyas that were laid across this ledge. And I was watching two young boys sitting in the front. And they didn't really understand the movie. What were they looking at? Those diyas. I wonder if I put my finger in that wax, what will happen? I wonder if I put this underneath my brother's seat, what, <laughs> what will happen? <laughs> so they're thinking about this. And if I told them before the movie, don't touch those diyas, they would have thought about this way more then. Because the mind doesn't know how not to do. The mind only knows how to, to do. So if my mind has this um, internal dialogue going on. For example, right here. Your internal dialogue again is, when is he going to finish? What are we going to eat? I heard it's going to snow on Tuesday. And you, it's all this dialogue going on. But if you start practicing japa, the thoughts are still going, but now in a direction you want it to go to. Isn't that the purpose of a steering wheel? The gas pedal will just push me forward, but who knows where? But if I attach a steering wheel there, it goes where, ideally, where I want it to go. Japa does three things. Raises the quality of thoughts, and when there's a higher quality, what automatically goes down? 
quantity. When you eat at a very good restaurant, you don't need to eat a lot. Become satisfied with the quality of that food. If I'm satisfied with the quality of my thoughts, if I have a few very good friends, I don't need a lot of friends then. They do the job. <laughs> the same thing goes with gurus. If you have one really, really good guru, you don't need to go shopping <laughs> for different gurus. You just have to find that, that one guru. So the qu quantity comes down. So quality up, quantity down. Only then can I change the direction. Away from being extrovert to being inward looking. Whenever I use the word introvert, we always get very scared about that. That person's a loser. That person's a recluse. That person doesn't have social skills. An introvert is simply looking inward for happiness. I call them intelligent because they've realized that outside is not going to make them happy. So raise, reduce, redirect. That's what Japa does for the thoughts. They're still going to come out, but now you put a steering wheel there. And the last way to reduce thoughts and dialogue is to watch. When we watch, we don't empower. A child is running in the hallway and they slip. What is the first thing they do? Look back to see if you saw them. And if you saw them, what do they do? Start to cry. And if you don't, if you're not empowering them, what do they do? Just get up and fall again. <laughs> right? I go skiing every year and once I had gone with my older cousins and younger cousins. So some the same age as me and some half the age. And I was skiing with my older cousins first and then I had to leave them right away because they were terrible. <laughs> and they, it's not that their skills were terrible, but every time they would fall, the first thing they would do is look around to see if I saw them or if someone else saw them. They were more afraid of judgment than getting hurt. But with kids, then I shifted and started skiing with my younger cousins. They would fall all the time. But they didn't care. They just got up and continued to ski. Like a good sports person. Who cares? Observe the thoughts. In contemplation, Puja Swami Shantananda says, we begin as exclamation marks. And slowly we evolve to question marks. <laughs> Some people are moving question marks a little like this. <laughs> <laughs> like a spring. <laughs> and in contemplation, where our knees didn't hurt before, they hurt more in contemplation. Where our neck wasn't sore before, is more sore. Where I didn't need to scratch my back, only in that spot that I can scratch. That's where I want to scratch. And what happens is that the thought comes in, and I start meditating on that thought. Forget about Bhagavan. Imagine if I can just scratch that one, that one spot. <laughs> So I empower it. And when I empower it, I have to act on it. So more come. But if I observe that thought flow in, anything that flows in will flow out. If you watch the Niagara Falls, any water on the top is going to flow down. It's not going to turn back like the Ganga and go towards its source. It will flow down. So observe. Next year, we are going to have a five-day retreat here in Pittsburgh. We haven't identified where. In silence. 120 hours. No speaking. Fully in Mona. I heard an awesome quote that said, When you eat, eat. When you walk, walk. Just a few simple English words, but so profound. So we did in Niagara a couple of weeks ago for 15 minutes. We were studying chapter 9 and similar thoughts came up. For 15 minutes they had to walk around our lecture hall. One foot over the other. That they couldn't walk faster than that. And just to observe. Observe the softness of the carpet. Observe the shine of Bhagavan. And then just start observing what you're thinking about. It was a very relaxing experience. And then enlightening. First the body becomes relax, relax, then the mind. So start to observe. So three points here. Karma Yoga, Japa, observe. In Sanskrit we call this being a Sakshi. There's two more questions which I'll answer next month. 
Does anyone here have any questions? Yes. Oh yeah, you had asked a question. Go ahead, say it again. Louder. <coughs> yes. And uh, with knowledge, we can cross over to light. But the original nature of the soul is of light and enlightenment and knowledge. So why did it happen the first time? And if it happened the first time, why can it not happen again once you've crossed over? Hmm. And this actually came from the, you were saying last time that if you know the purpose, what the cost benefit part of it, what is the benefit? Yeah. So it actually ties back to that. Sure. In simple words, the question is, if, we, if our nature is knowledge, where did ignorance come from? If our nature is light, how did this darkness come about? If I go deeper into the question, and our scriptures, our sages are saying, you are joy. You are the embodiment, the expression, the nature of joy. But nobody in this room is experiencing that right, right now. Really? <laughs> Your nature, and they look back like this. Who is he talking, <laughs> talking about? <laughs> we are not experiencing our nature because we don't know our nature. If I don't know I'm in Pittsburgh, I'm not going to try to find tickets to see the penguins. But if I know I'm in Pittsburgh, I may look out to see a concert at the consul center or whatever it may be. I have to know to benefit. It's like in Cleveland, they were saying some people ask people who come to the Davy Group if I'm going to come that month, if that week, because they only come when I come. I said, don't tell them I'm coming or not coming. But see, they're only looking. If I know he's coming, then we'll benefit. So I just told them, don't tell them he's coming, and, he's coming, and then I'll just say in spirit. <laughs> so our nature is knowledge. Ignorance cannot come out of knowledge. So all of this experience of sorrow in our lives is a illusion. It's not there. If you see a rope, if there's a rope there and you see a snake, that's like me asking, why did you see the snake? It's just an illusion that's taking place in the mind. And going deeper, there's no enlightenment. Who gets enlightened? This body doesn't know enlightenment. This body is the same as this microphone. My thighs don't know if I'm on the stage or that seat. And it's not the spirit. The spirit is infinite. What can bind the infinite? So the only factor in between is the ego. Mind, intellect, memory, ego. Because I believe I'm the ego, so I believe I'm bound, so I believe I have to get enlightened. But if I know the truth that I am free, Nobody's bound, so nobody can get enlightened. Even enlightenment is an illusion. You and I, and I'm saying this only for conversation, are enlightened. When we experience this fullness, we will laugh at ourselves. What was I doing thinking that I, I'm a body? I know I have a body, but I'm not the body. Right now I believe I am the body. It's not that I have a body. So the ignorance is not there. It is a illusion. And that's why the word maya, ma means no. Yaha means is. So no is, really in simple English means, maya makes the impossible possible. It's impossible for darkness to come from light, for ignorance to come from knowledge, for sorrow to come from joy, but maya makes this possible. But Maya is not real. Where is Maya? Can we touch it? Can we go there? Can we buy it? It's not there. So think lots about this, this question. And I'll leave one anecdote to help us remember this. It's the story of 17 horses. So a father has 17 horses. And he was going to pass away, so he wrote in his will, my eldest son will get half the horses. My second son will get a third of the horses. My youngest son will get a ninth of the horses. And he died. As soon as he finished, he died. 
Now the sons of this will, and there's 17 horses, and they're confused. How do these ratios work with 17? 17 is a prime number, right? He says, how, how are we going to do this? And they're all flustered and bickering with each other. So another man happens to be on a horse, right? Conveniently, he's on his horse and he, he comes by there. And he sees them bickering, so he asks, Hey, what are you all up to? And they explain their situation. So he says, Here, you take my horse too. So now they go through it. Now the son takes half of the horses. Half of 18, takes his nine in, goes away. Second son gets a third. A third of 18? Is that much? You're all thinking. What a calculator to take out the iPhone quickly. <laughs> Six. And he goes away. And the youngest son gets a nine. Which is how many of 18? So he takes his two horses and goes away. That man gets back on his horse and he leaves too. Nine plus six plus two is 17. How did it happen? Om Purnamadam Purnamidam Purna Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hi Harihi Om Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Harihi Om